Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second webinar in our teaching webinar series, our teaching research webinar series. Today, we're going to focus on theories of pedagogy of research teaching. So I want to welcome you all today to today's session. I am Megan Kowalski. I am the Outreach and Reference Librarian, and I am joined today by my colleague, Kathy Meals. Hello, everyone. Um, and so what we're doing with this series is we're discussing and looking at um, our experience in working with students and faculty as it relates to research. And it shows that there's a need for support on all sides of the teaching and learning experience. Um, our research shows that supporting your um, teaching experience amplifies the experience of both you as a faculty member and our students' learning outcomes. And our role as librarians is to support both faculty and students in learning and teaching research. It's essentially what we're here for. Um, and so we are beginning more of a faculty librarian collaboration and dialogue. So we invite your feedback and commentary both today and after this session. Um, and we wanna point out that faculty are recognized and are expected to be content experts as well as pedagogy pedagogy experts. And research pedagogy is an important subset of that that often doesn't get enough time and focus. And so we're trying to provide that professional development experience today. So just a quick look at our agenda. We're going to do a little bit of a warm up. Um, and then we're going to look at, whoop, did I bring up the wrong slides? Yeah, I think so. Oh, hang on. Do you want me to Sure. No, that will make things complicated. Yeah. One second. I uh, one. <laughs> I do apologize for that. Um, I had the wrong slide deck saved to my um, desktop, and that's what I opened. This is what happens when you've got multiple things going on. So uh, we can say that this is an important important skill that you can show your students. We do it all the time. It's okay to model failure. They learn from it. Um, so I do apologize for this, but we are go, uh, learning as we go here. And this is what I get for going straight from a conference into the office and not paying attention to what was on my desktop. Okay, one moment. I am almost, oops, that's the wrong deck again. Okay, here we go. Now I got the right deck up. So let me just get those. And again, too many windows going on. I do apologize again for all of this. And just to confirm, are you seeing my, the main slide? Yep. Okay. Okay. So now that we're getting back into this, now we're going to, uh, focusing back on what we're working on today, we're going to do a little bit of a warm up. We're going to ask you to engage a little bit, but if you don't want can, to be completely. Just hmm? real quick, I think I, we see a, a hide the ribbon. Ah, yeah, on. there you go. Well, I got to stop the share to hide the ribbon, apparently. Okay, back to just the slide. Yep, looks good. Fantastic. Okay. I apologize for all the shenanigans. Okay, so getting back into the swing of things. I'm going to do a little bit of warm up. If you don't want to share, that's okay. We completely understand. And then we're going to set the stage a little bit for what it means to uh, teach research. And then we're going to also look at some common student hurdles that we've encountered. And then we're going to get into a little bit of the best practices and explaining the why of teaching research. And as I mentioned at the start, we're going to have time for Q&A, both uh, recorded and unrecorded. So to get things started, we are interested in two things we'd love you to share. So what do you think your students' research approach and process is? So feel free to unmute yourself or drop it in the comments.
So welcome. We just had a couple of people join us. Um, we're doing a little warm up activity right now, um, thinking about what you think your students' research process is. Um, so if you want to put something in the chat or unmute and share, how do you envision students going through the research process when you give them an assignment? Uh, Dr. Shan Strong. Yes, thank you so much, um, Megan. I I believe that um, students believe that research involves engaging with written or digital literature um, regarding a particular topic, and in order to glean uh, information particular to a particular uh, related to a particular thesis or project. Um, and that the research should be comparatively considered using the scientific methodology uh, assigned by the instructor for that particular class and should be weighed against outcomes associated with that particular thesis as well. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's literally looking at what other people have written about the particular topic and then gleaning, gleaning information from, from written literature as opposed to uh, verbal literature regarding the topic. Okay, thank you for sharing. Uh, we have a few comments in the chat. One is, I think many of my students just go on Google and some go on YouTube to find articles and videos on their chosen topic. Another is just internet search, not involving uh, the, library, the library resources. And another looking for answers on Google or using ChatGPT. And yes, all of these are things we have seen and things students have shared with us. Uh, we wanna share a fun activity you can do. Later on, we'll mention something you can do to get a better understanding of how it is that students approach research. Um, and so to kind of reframe things, cause here at the library, we're always saying you are not your user. We as librarians, we live in this world of research. So we're constantly having to remind ourselves that the student in front of us does not have the background and experience we have. They have something different. They have so different skill sets to bring to the research process. And that's the same with your students in your class. So to get back to this thinking of how do students approach research? How did you learn to do research? You know, were you thrown in the deep end? Was it something you were taught? Um, we would be interested in hearing what you have to say on that. And I'll just start by, I think folks um, have a lot, a lot of folks might have this experience. I was thrown into the deep end. Um, I started um, my undergraduate education and it was assumed that I knew how to do it. And so there's a lot of figuring it out by myself. Um, but I'm curious to see what other folks' experiences were. Yeah, I can share. Yeah, go ahead, uh, David. So I think for me, one of my professors in grad told me to actually use Wikipedia, but kind of in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, so. He said, look at the sources in Wikipedia as a starting point, like the references. Mm -hmm. So I thought that really helped me when I was doing research. <clears throat> yeah, thanks. Uh, one of the comments uh, we've had here up in the chat, ooh, I got to get my scroll to work, is I took classes in my undergraduate and graduate learning experiences. And another engaging written or digital documents is generally the way that students approach research. Yes. And just to counterbalance how Kathy felt like she had to figure it out on her own, I am on the different spectrum of things, but it's by pure luck. My father happened to be a librarian, so I was just raised to this is how we approach the research process. But even then, as I was growing Growing up, the internet was slowly becoming a thing. And so my dad and I were learning together how to do research online because it's a completely different world. Um, I see we have a couple of hands raised. Let me get that up. Um, Dr. Chinta? Uh, yes, uh, I think my research process was really shaped by what I learned in my doctoral program. Uh, it's, it's really a, a structured pro uh, process, uh, starting with identifying gaps in the extent knowledge, which requires a very substantive in-depth understanding of what has been already done. And that really shape, um, <clears throat> takes shape in the literature review part of any published article. So yeah. looking, at, looking at what other people have done, looking at past, past research with a clear objective of identifying some gaps 
uh, gaps that were either uncovered or maybe gaps that can uh, uh, be identified by enhancing the research models themselves. Maybe they are too uh, parsimonious and maybe adding one more, one or two more variables will, will make it more practical or more comprehensive. So the initial reading of uh, the existing knowledge uh, leads into a research model, uh, which actually is uh, very clearly defining what variables will be included in the proposed research. And then moving on from the research model, which is really uh, identifying the narrow set of variables for study uh, and using that research model to construct uh, research hypotheses, uh, both the null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis, and then moving on to identifying target populations and sample selection, collecting the data and statistical analysis, then data analysis and uh, results and discussion, and then tying back to the extent uh, knowledge. How has this study contributed to uh, uh, the, re the for future research or for policymakers or for practitioners and so forth uh, that gets into the implications and conclusion. So it's really a coherent uh, um, a thread that runs through a research project uh, and that doesn't mean that you have to always follow that <laughs> that that coherent thread sometimes um, there are some anomalies that are happening in the outside world a novel phenomena uh, which uh, need to be researched with uh, there is there's no uh, prior knowledge to build on mm -hmm. it's completely a new phenomenon so that's when you do grounded research so that starts with uh, N equals one case studies and then learning from case studies and expanding the sample size and so forth. Uh, so research uh, process is all often instructed and it is coming down the generations and it doesn't mean we have to just always follow that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, before we get to our other hand, I want to say we have a comment that um, I was thrown into the fire in grad school. My instructors would send me feedback saying whether my sources were valid or invalid. And I will say that is fairly common. Kathy and I are doing a research project, and this is um, what spurred this webinar series. Um, and it's fairly common for people to feel like they did not get any instruction in research until they entered grad school, um, which many people think, no, but research starts long before then, and it does, but oftentimes we do not receive formal instruction until very late in our formal education process. Um, and so Dr. Shan Strong, you have your hand raised. Well, I didn't realize my hand was, was, was still raised. <laughs> okay, I can go Lord. ahead now. <laughs> Thank I you. Certain, I certainly applaud what, what Dr. <laughs> This, this, this indicated because my advisor was was the uh, and in graduate school was was the uh, uh, director or chair of the uh, journal of, um, of of higher education, and so you can imagine <laughs> he had such high standards, and so it's really amazing. You really don't know, but you but your advisor assumes that 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 you must reach uh, be introduced. To the highest level of, of, uh, of research uh, expertise and, and tools and, and guidelines necessary to produce documents worthy of printing or being printed in the Journal of, of Higher Education. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I, I, I disagree with everything that, that has been stated. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, one more comment we have. I got my master's. Whoop. Well, hang on, my chat jumped. I got my master's in English composition and rhetoric about 20 years ago, so it's less computer-based than commonly done today. I use card catalogs and journal abstracts, as well as other written sources to do my research. I came up with a hypothesis and worked to find sources that wrote on the hypothesis. The research process was supported by my professor advisor. Yes, that is also fairly common. Um, and so just so we can move on, I want to say thank Thank you for sharing this today because research is highly individualized and how we learn it is even more individualized. So Kathy's going to discuss, you know, considerations for teaching research to our students. Sure. Um, thanks, Megan. So some things to consider as you are teaching research to your student. And the first one, it sounds pretty obvious, but it's good to remember that yes. research is hard. Um, Megan mentioned a little bit before um, the, the contrast between where um, faculty are and expert researchers are vis-a-vis -vis students. Um, 
And I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind, you know, students position versus our own position, right? An expert researcher has gotten enough experience to see that research is a complicated nonlinear practice, um, that there's a community of practice around research. Um, the expert researcher is already familiar with the debates in their field, um, maybe is a little bit more comfortable with the ambiguity that often arises out of research and has their own strategies, right? Their own ways to handle research, to organize their searches, organize their materials, all of that. Students are coming into that. They're having to learn all of that from scratch, essentially, in most cases. So I, what I usually try to do is I try to think of something that I don't understand <laughs> at all. And I try to put myself in, in that mindset, right? If I'm trying to learn about this, this is what the students are experiencing. And for me, this is car engines and, you know, that kind of thing. I just cannot wrap my brain around that kind of thing. That's, that's not what my, my area of expertise is. Um, so I think about that, you know, that's, that's what students are encountering when they encounter a research project for the first time. Uh, another thing to encounter or to consider is that academic research is a much different animal than real life research. Um, students come in already having done research. Students are already researchers, right? What they've done is research related to their real lives, right? You know, they, we always say like, you know, they picked UDC for a reason. Did they research UDC? Um, you know, if their parents are caregivers, maybe they've, you know, researched potential, you know, babysitters or schools or, you know, things like that. They've already done some stuff like this, but academic research, it looks different. So what they're essentially doing is learning to research in a new discipline, right? This would be like a historian learning to do research in experimental psychology, right? It's, it's a new discipline for them. And then a couple of things about uh, what we discussed in our previous webinar about how students approach research, right? They know that they have to do it, right? They come into college expecting that they have to do it, but they don't necessarily already know what it is, right? Um, I think, you know, there's a little bit of an expectation. Google can do everything for them these days. Um, there's a huge variation in experience and knowledge of academic research and previous experiences doing research, things like that. And students these days are living in a world of information overload, right? There's information kind of all around us. Information is presented to us in a lot of ways um, rather than us finding it. The information comes to us rather than vice versa often. And then there's a lot of feelings, a lot of emotions. We spent a lot of time talking about this in the previous webinar. So if you weren't able to attend, um, strongly recommend that you uh, go back and check that out. Um, you know, students are excited. They, they are curious. Um, but on the other side of the coin, they're feeling stressed out. They might be intimidated or overwhelmed. Um, they might feel a little bit of shame for not knowing certain things. And they might feel a little bit unclear about um, the expectations for their assignments. And so this is where we can start discussing some common student hurdles. And these are things we see students encountering, um, the see the struggles they're having. It's also those things students tell us. Um, students for some reason just talk to librarians and tell us things they might not tell faculty members. And that's partly because we don't grade them. Um, and so these are things we've seen. And one of the biggest hurdles that we see is getting started. Students simply, you know, they're given an assignment and they don't know where to start. And that can come from a lot of areas. It can come from they simply don't understand the assignment. You know, maybe they're not quite sure, you know, what they're being asked to do. Um, students might also be like, okay, I understand the assignment, but I don't have any clue of what I want to work on. You know, finding that first topic and figuring out what they want to write about or, you know, create a research project of is difficult. But then when they do find something, once they pick a topic, finding something of appropriate scope is difficult, particularly because when they start diving into the research, they're hitting that overwhelm. And so they're like, do I go this way? Do I go this way? Am I including everything? Is this enough? And so what happens is students generally create a research topic or thesis that is far too broad than can be reasonably researched in an undergraduate paper. And so this information overwhelm means they tend to default to the familiar, which is why you see students go to Google and ChatGPT and Wikipedia and Twitter and TikTok so often. Um, you know, 
there's also an understanding of, but okay, why do I need scholarly sources? You know, they're, they're not quite sure what it means. You know, why is some information different from others? You know, what role does this information play in their work and in their assignment? And because there's so many types of information out there, they're sometimes missing the context of what that piece of information is within the overall research and information landscape. And then they struggle with their own analysis. Students oftentimes come to us from high schools and in their early undergraduate classes being somewhat comfortable with reflective writing. But then when it comes to doing analysis of existing information, where they're being asked to read something, critically think about it, and then interpret it and provide analysis on it, that can be a difficult hurdle because they're being asked to do something new. And so these are also things that faculty have told us. And in our research process or in our research project, Kathy and I are working with um, some general education writing professors, and what we see at the library desk is reflected in what these faculty see in their classroom. And so this is why Kathy's going to end up talking about when it comes to teaching research, you need to explain the why. Right. Above all, um, I think when teaching research skills are, are teaching a class where research skills and information literacy are learning outcomes, it's really important to explain why, right? It may seem feel obvious to us, it isn't always obvious to students. And the top thing I wanna mention here is that research is a process. Um, so we should teach it as a process, right? Research, research is not a linear process. It is iterative. It combines feedback on itself. So it's important for us to teach it as a process so that students understand that. And of course, you know, the process in a particular discipline um, will vary, right? So, you know, you're teaching yours, right? Um, you know, so if you're teaching in an in, in engineering class or in a business class, you're teaching about the, the methodology and the process that exists in your discipline, in your community of practice. Remember, research is a skill set that's strengthened over time and with practice, right? You also do learn to do research by doing it, like a lot of us did but it's helpful to still have that guideline or that framework that it is a process. And sometimes that process shows how research can translate to outside of the class context as well, just to show that process of how you go through the, the research. So research is also messy, right? This is it, it's sort of teaching the process lays that bare, right? Um, and so it's important to prepare students for that mess, right? <laughs> um, I think oftentimes what we see is that, you know, students do anticipate a relatively linear process of Google information, find information, put in paper. And then when it's not like that, that's when the kind of freakouts happen, right? Where you get nervous and the, the, the feelings of overwhelm and shame come on up too. So part of that process that we really try to reinforce with students is this idea that we term, we've termed it research resilience, right? Challenges are inevitable. In research, they we all encounter them regardless of how expert we are. They're totally normal. Um, and so we have to help our students expect that, right? Expect a process rather than a straight line. And lastly, we have the ACRL framework is our last bullet point here. The ACRL is the Association of College and Research Libraries. It's the professional organization for academic librarians. And we have um, in our discipline uh, a framework for information literacy that outlines threshold concepts and other issues related to what it means to be information literate. Um, definitely take a look at that if you have not, the ACRL framework for information literacy. But one of the things that it does that I think is really helpful is that it frames information literacy and in research as something that's both what you do, the skills and the actual actions, as well as how you think. Right. I think previously our field had, you know, what we referred to as information literacy competency standards, which were very much like skills, you know, specific steps and things like that. The framework is, which in some ways it makes it a little more complicated, right? But the good thing about it is that it does make it a little bit more theoretical, right? In, in kind of bigger picture, we can take a little bit of a step back. And so the framework offers knowledge practices um, and dispositions, right? And so for each of the threshold concepts that it covers when about becoming information literate or continuing to develop it because it's a never ending process, they offer examples of knowledge practices. So the things that we actually do when we do research, um, you know, iterative searching, um, 
understanding that authority uh, is constructed and contextual. That's one of my, my favorite um, of the ACRL frames. But it also has dispositions and that's how you think about research, right? So it's not just one thing to say, okay, well, I'm gonna do a search. I'm gonna do another search. I'm gonna do another search. It's being able to situate that within a broader iterative process, right? To understand that research is inquiry. And both of those things, both those skills and the approaches to thinking about it are necessary for learning to be a researcher, developing your research skills and becoming a lifelong learner. And so this is where you know, best practices to teaching research come into play. So the first thing you want to do for your students and maybe even for yourself, depending on how far removed you might be from learning research, um, is to define what you mean by research. Because yes, there is a strict dictionary definition, but how that appears in practice is kind of a little messy. So you want to tell your students, what are they doing? And then also why? And then on top of that, what are your specific disciplinary conventions, because as Kathy mentioned previously, how research looks in the STEM field is different from the humanities, is different from just some exploratory writing research. And so you want to have considerable guidance for your students and what you mean when you ask them to do a research process or a research project, because without that guidance, they tend to approach research as simply collecting information and spitting it into a paper. It's a lot of cut and paste. And so if you want students to know what research really means and the how and why of how to use information and to be a little savvy in this area, you want to focus on the process as much as you focus on the outcomes. And so you don't want to provide the rules of what it means to research in your class or in your field without, you know, the explanation behind those rules. Because once you connect the students to the why, they not only engage better in your actual assignment, but in the overall process of research. And then you also want to detail what are your outcomes, not just for this one specific assignment, but for teaching your students research in general. What do you want them to do? Why do you want them to do it? And what is the expected outcome? So assignment directions, you know, tend to focus on, you know, mechanics and formatting and the final product rather than the process of how to go about or where to do searches. You know, a lot of times we encounter students in the library who were told, go do research. And that that's it. That's all they were told. And they don't yet know, do I need peer reviewed? Can I use stuff on the internet? Because again, research is so amorphous these days without connecting the why or having explicit outcomes, the students don't quite have enough of a roadmap to follow to finish the assignments. And so you know, assignments are designed by faculty who are experts in their subject field, but it's hard for students, you know, particularly at the undergraduate level to understand that, you know, we understand, we see it all the time and we do it all the time as librarians is we're presuming a certain level of knowledge that our students, particularly at the undergraduate level may not have. And so again, students are a little afraid of that ambiguity and the non-linearity of the research process. So you want to explain that in terms that they can understand understand where you're connecting the process to the outcomes. And hopefully in connecting that, the students have better, you know, success in learning research overall while they complete their assignment. And then what you also want to do is make it relevant to them. And there's a couple of reasons you want to do that. One, our students these days are very motivated by, you know, what am I getting out of the college experience. You know, they're told to complete an assignment, but what they're thinking in their head is, how can I turn this into a marketable skill that gets me a job? And so you want to connect your research assignment to something that is relevant to the student, whether it's their overall major or whether it's connecting it to the real life, whether it's their work, you know, a lot of our students work, you know, their caregiving practices or their overall community that they live in. And another reason you want to do this is simply students who think the research assignment they're working on is relevant to them, find it more interesting, and thus they have more motivation to complete that assignment. And that also helps them produce better all, overall work at the end. And again, this is especially true for our student body who have been marginalized. Um, and so they don't feel like they're a part of the traditional, you know, overall land landscape of higher education or academia. So saying your voice matters, I want to hear it show me how you can build on this existing research by adding your voice makes it far more relevant to them. They engage with it more and they feel empowered. 
So a few other best practices that we want to mention, um, treating research as a process and teaching it as a process is also a really helpful way to scaffold it, right? That's a good pedagogical practice, scaffolding. Um, research is a mess. Um, it can be hard to scaffold a mess, but there's still ways that you can kind of chunk it down a little bit. So, you know, some options would be low stakes research assignments, right? Um, you may be familiar with the, the low stakes writing assignments concept. There's similar things that you can do with research. You know, small things that um, you could do in class um, that either are ungraded or have you know minimal contribution to a grade. Um, micro assignments, um, discussion board posts that allow for reflection. Annotated bibliographies are um, a really good tool for scaffolding. Uh, we've seen a lot of people use that. It's a way to practice citations, but also that kind of summarizing, the paraphrasing, the analysis skills. It sort of captures all of those things at once and also allows students it, to do searching, right? To do some of that investigation, to do some of that iterative searching. Um, all of that clarifies that research is a process too. The scaffolding also supports students with varying levels of experience and expertise, right? I think students come in with so much, many different levels of experience, so much previous research knowledge about libraries in general, academic libraries, academic research, all of that. And so scaffolding it pretty thoroughly can help you support those students who are at different points. Then if you scaffold it too, you as a faculty member, as an instructor, can see the intermediate steps that a student is taking in a process, right? Um, there's a, an article that we have read that talks about um, research as kind of an iceberg where the final product that uh, students turn into a faculty member is, you know, the 20% of the iceberg that is above water and the remaining 80% below water is the work that went into it that you don't necessarily see in the final product. But if you're scaffolding it and there are intermediate steps, you can see some of that 80% that brings that out. Uh, to complement that scaffolding, um, research is really good reflective, is something as a reflective practice. Right? It's an opportunity for metacognition, um, how to apply the skills and the concepts to other situations. Um, you know, this might take place as reflective writing assignments um, that will help you know, demonstrate students' thought processes, um, work on critical thinking, might even help, um, you know, kind of diagnose those challenges or sticking points um, that are coming up in the semester so that faculty can address them in time, right? If you see that it's happening along the way, you can intervene at the, the point of need, right? Um, and then call in the help. Right, we can help. That's that's what the librarians are here for. For students, um, you know, we can help students um, who have varying levels of background if they need some extra support in certain areas. We are there to help support that. We're a supplement to what you're doing and another resource for them. And then for you all, I think um, we can sort of librarians can serve as sort of mediators, right, um, between faculty and students um, when working on information literacy and research, right. Um, so we can help. You know, we do research all the time, so we understand you know, the perspective of doing research, feeling like an expert, being really well versed in your disciplinary conversations and, and conventions. But we also work with students so in so much in depth that we see, you know, where the kind of gaps are, right? And so we can help make those expectations that you have of your students and the process that you want them to go through. We can help make that more available to them, more transparent to them. And so one thing we want to end on is that to get a sense of how your students are approaching the research process, one thing you might want to consider is at the very beginning when you're assigning a research assignment to make it okay that we're talking about how different students approach the research process differently is do a simple assignment like have your students draw out their research process. You know, if you're in a classroom, have them do the whiteboard or have them do one of those giant sticky notes to just get them started with thinking about, okay, what does it look like when I'm told, here's an assignment, you have to start doing research. Because it's not only okay, it gets everyone laughing in the room because, you know, sometimes you're going to see squiggles of people being like, I have no idea what's going on. Sometimes they'll just write Google. Um, you know, other times you'll see someone do step-by-step because -step they know what they're doing. And that just shows students, you know, that Everyone is different and that's okay because research is something that we all experience differently. We all go through it differently. My process is different from your process and that's okay as long as we're getting the end results that we need. And so this is why it can be a good idea to talk about it 
as a process. Share your process with your students. You know, some of them are going to be fascinated. You know, how did you get to write that paper that you published? Or how did you write that book? Share the process and then have some time for, again, that reflection. And so, we want to provide this as an opportunity for you to reflect on the research process or working with students on research. We also want to give time for some questions and answers. So please, you know, raise your hand or put it in the chat and we'll also have time for some unrecorded questions at the end. And again, if you ever want to work with the library on this, either in teaching research overall with assignment design or anything like that, please don't hesitate to contact us. See, Dr. Chinta, you have your hand raised? Uh, yeah, there's just one more small thread I want to add. Uh, this is excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, as a faculty member, I have engaged a lot of students in uh, research projects as collaborators. So uh, they can just do one small piece in all those steps that uh, I delineated earlier and can actually experientially learn the research process by being in the process. Uh, they don't have to do all the steps in, uh, uh, in producing a publication, but they can just maybe get engaged in either literature review or data analysis or some piece. So experiential learning uh, uh, in a particular project led by the faculty member would be another thread that you can just uh, add to what you're doing here. Yeah, yeah absolutely you. and it helps them you know help students situate what they're doing within that process right and have that extra mentorship and, and learning experience great yeah we once had a faculty member comment you know research is a process but you also need practice with it so it's like driving a car yeah you can read the manual and all these books about how to drive a car but at some point you're going to have to get behind the wheel and do it to actually become a better driver and research is the same way we need to teach the process but we also need to give students a chance to practice their skills so that calls back to what you were doing having them engage in the process itself and also what kathy mentioned by having these scaffolded baby steps and these low stake writing assignments to help them engage with the process. <clears throat> Dr. Shan Strong? Yes, and I would like to remind everyone that the Office of Career Services or directly or with the faculty from a co-curricular perspective to ensure that, that students are enabled uh, to uh, develop cover letters and resumes and skills necessary to acquire employment uh, and to learn the skills within the experiential learning environment, which happens to be the classroom. So it's so important to think about the faculty and staff, even though I've taught for 24 or 24 years, but, but I'm not teaching. Here, I've only taught the orientation course at this, this university, but it's very important to, to know that there, that there are other uh, units on campus working in tandem from a co-curricular perspective to help students to begin to think, articulate, and to, to write and display uh, their uh, research skills in order to acquire expertise in their area and obtain employment. So from a co-curricular perspective, I think we should be thinking about ways of involving the entire institution in making sure that students' goals are met and that research is seen as, as, as academically oriented as well as uh, real life, uh, as, is, as, uh, as you indicated in the beginning, oriented and this academic research scientific skills can be applied in, in, in any situation to help students make the right decision. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna give one more moment in case anyone would like to share in a recorded session.
Okay, not seeing anything else. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording, um, just in case anyone would like to have any discussion unrecorded.